computer. All right, welcome back to the uh, Young Idealist. And today I have a special guest with me. I have uh, Martin Belge. He's a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Amsterdam and works on the European, European philosophy since Kant. Um, he has major preoccupations, include the work of Schelling, Rothschild, and more recently, Salam Maimon. Um, Martin is, con is concerned in, with the way in which probably relates to many facets of religion, a relation which his mind is laden with opposition and rivalry, and it's also filled with promise. I like that. Fantastic. Mm. Welcome, Martin. Mm. Um, it's so great to have you here today. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, for inviting me um, to talk about Rosenzweig, which is after all one of the most stimulating things that one could do with one's Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> so as, as my, I have two ongoing series right now, one that is working through classical German philosophy and German idealism. And the other, um, which is kind of my baby, is um, the a series on the Jewish thinkers of German classical philosophy, German idealism, and post-Kantian thought. And one of the thinkers that has always um, stuck out to me is Franz Rosenzweig and his importance to this tradition. And as Benjamin Pollock states that, um, Rosenzweig is one of the most original Jewish thinkers of the modern period. And this is why I have you here today to discuss who Rosenzweig was, what his thought was, um, and how we can navigate through his concepts and philosophies. So maybe we can begin by starting with his significance, um, the importance of his work, and why we should read Rosenzweig. That's kind of a, a huge question to throw at you already, but Hopefully it's not too much. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, the reason why we should care about Rosenzweig is, of course, because he has some uh, difficult, challenging, but also rich ideas that, um, you know, uh, pose problems for us that we haven't quite resolved yet. So in, in an obvious sense, this is true of many thinkers, uh, but perhaps there is a sense in which the thought of Rosenzweig uh, still has not been processed to the extent that it could be safely skipped over from a philosophical perspective. Uh, that's one thing. Another reason, of course, is that he occupies a, you know, aside from systematic philosophical concerns, is that he occupies something of an exemplary place in the wider history of European and particularly German um, thought. He, um, if we can dive into his life a little bit straight away, forms part of a generation born in the last years of the 19th century. So Rosenzweig himself is born 1886, but that puts him in the company of a whole range of other people, uh, such as the Swiss theologian Karl Barth, who was born 1886 as well, but also um, the philosopher Heidegger, born 1889, and Rosenzweig's uh, future friend and comrade, uh, Martin Buber, himself born 1878. Now, what unites all these figures is uh, not so much that they're all German professors, though that is also the case to some extent, um, but more that they represent a generation uh, that is um, forced to tear up the securities and the, you know, the general somewhat placid landscape of thought of the late 19th century and try to formulate something like a new beginning for European thought after the First World War. And if you want to compare this with you know, other disciplines, you know, it's, not, it's not altogether a coincidence that at the same time um, within literature, um, modernism rears his head. So we have Proust and uh, James Joyce writing, uh, for example, right? And um, 
new paradigms of thought are uh, being come up with that for the first time in a long time seem to be much more skeptical about ideas of progress and liberalism that at least in intellectual circles had done very well in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century. And these are confronted with the, the terrible shock that is, shall we say, European civilization tearing itself up in the First World War. Um, so there is um, an important dynamic in Rosenzweig's work internal to the history of philosophy, but at the same time, this is very clearly connected to larger movements within art, but also in politics. Um, and uh, the end of the long 19th century, as historians uh, like to call it. Well, thank so, you. Oh. Yes, uh, no, no, I, I wanted to begin by situating him against the backdrop of that crisis. Um, I'm happy to uh, be redirected, um, but one way in which this is particularly visible in the case of uh, Rosenzweig uh, himself, uh, Rosenzweig himself serves in the German army during uh, the First World War. He is, amongst other things, an artillery spotter in Macedonia uh, on the southern front. And while there also begins, to our amazement, um, scribbling on the back of postcards, um, shorter and longer notes that he sends off back home that will become the substance of what we now see as his major work, The Star of Redemption, which would ultimately come out in 1922, right after the war. Just to remind us what sort of climate we're, we're in, uh, 22 is The Star of Redemption. Martin Buber's famous uh, work, I and Thou, will come out just a year later. And also, um, in a way, uh, as a result of lectures that Rosenzweig got Buber to give, so his hand is very much present there, um, but uh, work that changes the nature of Protestant theology uh, for good one, I uh, might say, comes out in 1921, so his commentary on the Epistle to the Romans. And uh, Heidegger's being in time uh, is 27 itself. So what we see is that right after the war, there is a terrible uh, need for revolutionary works that enable something like a new beginning within European thought. And that is a beginning that starts from, in a way, from um, the slag heaps of what came before. In the case of Rosenzweig, Star of Redemption itself begins explicitly with the question of death and how to live with it. Um, and while that is, of course, a hallowed philosophical topic and is not to be reduced to a biographical fact about uh, having to be in the army, um, it is nevertheless not altogether accidental either, I think, that the uh, experience of an experience of human existence that does not rest securely within the um, idea that the power of ideas can save us, but addresses uh, our very existence itself, that this should become uh, important precisely in this moment um, cannot be a coincidence. That's, thank you so much for that. That was fantastic. Are, do you have more of his biography you would like to go through, or do you want to now go to more areas of his philosophical work? Right. Well, one big problem with someone like Rosenzweig is that he has a terribly interesting life. <laughs> for someone who lived such a short while, he would himself die in 1929, um, it is nevertheless remarkable how much uh, interest his life has attracted and that uh, for, for good reasons and bad. I already mentioned uh, the uh, question of his involvement in the war. But um, aside from that, there is, of course, the uh, 
the huge question of his relationship to his own being a Jew, to Judaism as a people that one could belong to, but equally to Judaism as a religion. Uh, Rosenzweig was born in um, Kassel in a rather rich Jewish family uh, that was um, as good as completely assimilated and uh, had been, in a way, enjoying the good liberal bourgeois life uh, for a little bit. Uh, Judaism was acknowledged as a fact, but not particularly thematized. It wasn't something that you would uh, put too much effort in. And uh, it is uh, this sort of attitude that uh, means Rosenzweig is growing up more or less indifferent to his own uh, Judaism, to the point that once he starts taking questions of religion, um, once they become part of the focus of his own thinking, I said, well, as, as Judaism is clearly no longer a living force for us German Jews, us assimilated bourgeois German Jews, um, isn't it just uh, hypocrisy or laziness that stops us from tossing it overboard? If we are in all but name as Christian as all of our neighbors, well, then we might as well convert, haven't we? Um, and so this is the uh, this is this is the big question for uh, Rosenzweig as a young man whether that is uh, then the step he would have to take. However, and here comes an interesting twist. Um, according to the biographical scraps that we have and this voluminous correspondence. Uh, the question comes up, can I renounce a Judaism that I don't particularly know anything about, other than going to synagogue twice, perhaps, a year when mother sends me? Um, and so the idea becomes, well, in order to renounce this Judaism, uh, I had best know it beforehand, so that if I convert, I can convert as a Jew who has thought about things and not as a lazy latter-day pagan. This seems to be the idea. Um, and investigating his Judaism, um, he finds out that rather than an exhausted tradition that has nothing to offer uh, anymore at all, uh, much to the contrary, uh, there's every reason uh, to hold on to it. And as it is possible to remain a Jew, the conversion to Christianity becomes for him superfluous and therefore uh, not one that can be made. So that's certainly an, an enormous part of, uh, of Rosenzweig's personal life and also part of the uh, Rosenzweig myth, so to say. I say myth because um, this creates uh, a, a sort of romantic reception of uh, uh, Rosenzweig's life and interest in his work uh, that sees him as the uh, um, the figure who finds out how in modernity again to articulate a meaningful concept of. Judaism that's not simply anti-traditional, but also escapes bourgeois liberal assimilationism, right? And so that creates a lot of uh, interest as, a, as, a, as an existential possibility for modern Judaism to live. One problem with that view is, right, and in, in some versions of this story, as it's told of uh, Rosenzweig's life, one can find this in some of the earlier sources, there is the idea that he then went to a... a Yom Kippur service, for example, for the first time in a long time, and then heard the authentic uh, voice of God and decided to move aside uh, his earlier hesitations regarding uh, Judaism. And this moment of conversion um, sees on, sees on the tradition again. Part of the problem with that is that for those of us who are stuck with the, the task of actually reading his letters, as opposed to just um, the philosophical work, uh, there's not that much sign of uh, such a conversion moment actually taking place in this manner. And more recent scholarship has pointed out, it's very interesting, uh, 
that Rosenzweig was not so much um, uh, called back to Judaism uh, in a in a sudden moment of awakening, but rather uh, realized that what may have attracted him to a certain form of Christianity, as he got to know it, could after all also be found in some way within Judaism for reasons that are philosophical and profound and that hopefully we will get to as we investigate the Star of Redemption um, a little bit. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I was wondering, um, so he, he became interested in philosophy through his cousin, I think. Um, I could be wrong about this. And from there, he started working through I believe it's, I forget his cousin's name, but he was working through Hegel um, and Neo-Hegelianism. And then of course he writes his uh, dissertation on Hegel and the state. And he's un he's not satisfied with Hegel's all sweeping uh, statism. Let's, let's call it that. No, it's gonna annoy my Hegelian friends, but that's all right. Uh, and from this um, movement, um, do you see, do you see any of his later thought um, being influenced by this moment of maybe turning away from from Hegelianism or do you see it um, being a an influence on him? How does this period work in the in the later years of his uh, thinking? This kind of earlier kind of work with on his dissertation. I think it's with Meineke. He's working with yes. Meineke. So um um, Rosenzweig uh, cast about in his first years as a university student between different subjects for a while. Uh, his family had high hopes that he would become a doctor, uh, but he was seduced sooner or later by the famous historian Meinecke to become his student instead. So um, What's interesting about this is that, though officially this was uh, in uh, the Department of History, um, Rosenzweig chose a very philosophical angle on a historical question uh, and uh, ended up writing a, something along the lines of 800 page dissertation, as one does, uh, on precisely on Hegel and the state. Now, when you speak of a turning away from Hegel, I'm not sure that um, we should infer that uh, at some point Rosenzweig was a Hegelian or would have liked uh, to be one. Um, it's, a, it's a very long and a somewhat tedious work, I find, um, but don't repeat that, in which he uh, traces very carefully, step after step, year after year, writing after writing, what sort of po position Hegel takes vis-a-vis -vis the concept of the state. And so this is how you fill hundreds of pages. You know, if every new writing is a new step along the way, and you very carefully dissect every minute step, and you also signpost this against the development of um, German politics at the time, in particularly the development of Prussia as a state, and to what extent it is leaning more towards a liberal course or more towards a repressive conservative force, um, these um, questions are very much in play. The book is on the surface not an anti-Hegelian tract. Um, and in fact, uh, there seems to be some disappointment in uh, Rosenzweig that you know, after all, Hegel wasn't simply uh, a bad old conservative who believed in the power of the state, right? The passage often cited from the Rechtsphilosophie of the state being God manifest on earth. Well, it's not to say that Hegel doesn't say those things, but they require a little bit more careful unpacking than simply being searched for consumption like that. Um, in fact, uh, Rosenzweig uh, says, well, you know, there was more promise in what Hegel ultimately ended up saying than what we got with Bismarck. So to the extent that this is a disappointed book, it's a book that's a little disappointed in, in, in uh, how far we could get with, with Hegel, but it's more critical yet of his own time, 
of the uh, German Empire in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century. And this is also part of it. It is, of course, finished um, before the breakout of the First World War. So at this stage, uh, Rosenzweig is working through these ideas on political philosophy. And he is skeptical that a political philosophy, a bourgeois liberal order even, which would be sort of the, the, the best that one could hope for, would philosophically deliver us um, the salvation that he will later become focused on in his own work. Um, we have a very clear shift away from the idea that the establishment of a good public order will solve, will crown the achievements of philosophy by uh, you know, creating order and goodness in the world. So um, that said, that said, Philosophically, Rosenzweig is already then, and very much remains, a uh, committed anti-Hegelian, not just because he thinks that a political order in the world cannot deliver on what is most required for uh, a thinking and acting person, um, but because the idea of totality that is hiding in all corners of Hegel's thought and not just his political ones is in and of itself a problematic one. So what unites Rosenzweig with some of the other figures that I have mentioned earlier on is also uh, what, what you might call the, the existential protest of the individual against a whole that seeks to encapsulate and neutralize it. This is why in the opening passages of uh, the Star of Redemption, the justly famous ones, um, it is precisely this experience of the individual in the face of his death that takes him out of a world of comforting ideas um, in which the Commonwealth or um, our ethical order can somehow uh, account for what is required in life uh, and insist instead that precisely my life is my life alone to lead, my cross to bear, and that I cannot escape engaging with it on that level. So um, when Benjamin Pollock says that uh... Rosenzweig in, in this kind of early era is he's trying to kind of create a, a total renewal of thinking. Um, is this this moment that you're talking about this movement away from this kind of anti Hegelianism as you as you speak? Um, uh, you know, there we can we can move into the star and then speak about um, revelation and the absolute later or, or coming up right now if you'd like. Um, but it's he seemed as you were talking about the individual. I just I just kept getting these highlights from this text. Right. Um, well, it's certainly the case that uh, the Star of Redemption is not a book that is lacking in ambition. So, to what extent could one say that it seeks to? I'm not sure what phrase you just used, but to, to begin a completely new way of thinking. In a certain sense, I think uh, that that is precisely the claim. Yes, it's not altogether accidental that an essay from 1925, so just a few years after the appearance of the star, um, and this essay is called The New Thinking, I warmly recommend this for anyone who is interested in the work of Rosenzweig but does not have the time to spend uh, months and months on burrowing through hundreds of pages of um, abstruse German metaphysics. The best chance at a concise and, uh, and um, um, energizing um, description of what Rosenzweig himself thinks he's doing 
from only a few years after the star itself was written, um, is this essay uh, the new thinking? And so here he repeats what he's already said in the star, that uh, there is a problem with the history of philosophy as a whole, from beginning to end, and in its full extent. Um, yes, because why would one be any more modest in one's claims than that? Philosophy from Ionia, as he says, to Jena. And Jena, of course, here stands for the place where famously, as Hegel puts the final full stop at the end of the manuscript of the Phenomenology of Spirit, he looked out the window and saw Napoleon on his horse right past who had just won the Battle of Jena, right? And so we have this sense of the history of philosophy as Hegel himself likes to think of it a lot, namely as something that just essentially leads up to him and allows him to be the recuperating figure that, that completes and perfects the history of philosophy. Um, interestingly enough, precisely because he is an anti-Hegelian, Rosenzweig will say that this is fundamentally uh, not untrue, but not in a sense that we would want to be happy about, because this tradition is characterized by a fundamental problem, namely, it is unable to think individual existence, such as we need to be able to think if we are to do justice to our experience of our own finitude and mortality. That, at least, is one aspect of it, because there are more. Um, the fact that I, as an individual, if I want to take myself seriously, cannot allow myself to be absorbed in a larger whole, be it of ideas or be it of political uh, order, um, is certainly one aspect. But, um, says Rosenzweig, if we say, take a step back, we see that the larger problem that the history of philosophy has always had is that it's concerned with three fundamental ideas and it tries to somehow fit them together so that it can derive everything from one of them or somehow um, without deriving them, um, organize them in such a way that uh, they form a coherent whole. And these th three things are then, of course, uh, the world, God, and the individual or man, uh, as uh, you could still get away with saying in Rosenzweig's time. About uh, Rosenzweig's sexual politics, politics, there are more interesting things to say uh, later as well, by the way. So let me just put a pin in that for now. Um, but stay with those three ideas. Now, um, the world, God, and man, or the world, God, and the soul, uh, are, of course, not completely uh, three uh, random ideas. In fact, uh, they should be familiar from Kant's first critique, right? As the uh, ideas uh, that we absolutely need uh, to be thinking, cognizing uh, agents, but uh, that are not altogether within the limits of uh, our possibility to cognize them because no experience uh, corresponds to them. So what what's the problem with these three things? Well, if we leave Kant for what he is for a second and um, put this in the perspective of the history of philosophy, Rosenzweig will tell you well, the attempt to think these three things at the same time and to somehow bring them together leads the classical world to essentially say that everything is cosmos. Right? If we read Plato and Aristotle, then fundamentally, Rosenzweig's argument is, uh, everything is submitted to the idea of the world, the cosmos, and there is no genuine room for a god who is beyond, in one sense, or on the other, uh, an individual being who is not simply absorbed in this, in this whole. Um, the Middle Ages show uh, the same problem, but this time the uh, weight is shifted to God. So the Christian Middle Ages, at least, 
uh, God is so central that he leaves no genuine room for the world or for the individual. And ultimately, idealism, as he sees it, hints that by Kant, but then most certainly uh, developed in, in uh, German idealism after that, uh, is one in which everyone is ultimately, everything is ultimately reduced to the I, the thinking I that becomes the bearer of all there is and uh, somehow must become the absolute I. Right? A big problematic that Fichte and Schelling uh, in their own way struggle with and that keeps uh, popping up in, in Hegel as well. So this uh, for Rosenzweig is the issue. This is the, the original sin of philosophy is that it tries to think these three things at the same time in one whole, in one totality. Rosenzweig's big innovation is to say this is precisely where things go wrong and this is precisely what we should not be doing. These three elements, as he will end up calling them in the Star of Redemption, need to be taken uh, in and of themselves and in separation from the other three if we are to understand them to the extent that we can at all. So you're right, there is a program here at work, an ambitious philosophical program of um, having a new methodological starting point that departs from the history of philosophy as such. And uh, so the, the, the existential uh, protest that I um, registered before is only part of this, is only part of this. So I think now that we, we've we um, gone over some of these ideas, I think we should move to the star now, the star of redemption. Um, can you maybe, <laughs> I know it's uh, it's kind of hard to do this, but can you maybe tell us about the actual text, um, maybe go over its main philosophical argument, um, some of the main concepts, and why it's uh, such a radical text, if you can. I know that's, um, I know, you're, you're you're almost in a sense limiting the text. It's a very brilliant, rich text, but um... it's a brilliant and rich text. But it's also uh, a very systematic one, and uh, in in a way, it is very surprising that a text that Rosenzweig himself uh, composed more or less in isolation, and for an important part without endless uh, library resources at his disposal in a very compressed and anguish-laden time, managed to produce a text that is nevertheless, at least seemingly, unless you start applying a lot of pressure on individual arguments, of an exemplary systematicity. Um, now, the 20th century since Rosenzweig has not necessarily been one that uh, is enamored with philosophical systematicity. And so whether this is a good thing or not <laughs> remains to be seen. But uh, uh, I do think it's true that it's uh, remarkable just how coherent uh, this text is. Um, has to be remembered as well uh, that uh, once... Rosenzweig completes the text um, and publishes it, he essentially says goodbye to it. He chooses, for reasons that perhaps we will have a moment to talk about uh, later, not to pursue a university career, not uh, to uh, take up a lectureship, even though as a you know with the previous work that he had done, uh, he would have had a promising career uh, ahead of him chooses not to do that. And so the work is more or less abandoned to its own free-floating reception history that takes place after that. Good. Let's leave that aside for a second and look a little bit closer at, at what actually goes on in this book. I've already started, in fact, talking about this a little bit um, because the three elements of world, God, and man that 
um, I just talked about are also the structuring principles of the first part uh, of the book. And so um, the task would be for Rosenzweig to show what we can know about these three things. Now, as this is a uh, philosophical project that wants to start from nothing, presuppositionless in a certain sense, though these three ideas themselves are to Rosenzweig, not just things that he accidentally found in the table of contents of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. He believes they are somehow part of the mental inventory of human thought as such, or perhaps you know, of, of the universe, and there's no way we can simply abstract from them. In that sense, the comparison with something like Heidegger's work uh, is, of course, instructive because they're reaching back to these ideas that are already present in the tradition would precisely be seen as itself a problem for a philosophy that wants to start afresh. But Rosenzweig holds on to them and then tries to derive them from, well, from what he himself says is nothing. And so we get on each of these three topics, a complex uh, reading, that starts with the idea of not knowing um, what they are and ends up with some sort of uh, knowledge of uh, what they would look like in their separateness. So um, the best we can do with these th three ideas in and of themselves for Rosenzweig is to have them in isolation and to take the example here, which is easiest to, to follow, of uh, of the human being, of the individual. Um, if we think through the concept of the, the, the individual properly, as uh, Rosenzweig uh, wants it, what we end up with is something like uh, what he sees as the hero of Greek tragedy. That may surprise, because now we ha suddenly have moved away from uh, a somewhat dry and technical philosophical discussion into something that at least seemingly is much more culturally thick. And we have a reference to a whole world of ideas that's in place. And uh, that is perhaps not as surprising once we realize that, of course, Rosenzweig uh, is an assiduous reader of the German idealists, and that um, you know, this sort of cultural richness that he is, uh, is dealing with as part of his philosophical mechanism is very much what you uh, might be used to from, say, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, say, uh, Schelling's work. Uh, Rosenzweig is, uh, in particular, uh, systematically a fan of Schelling for reasons that we again, may touch on briefly in a moment. Um, but what is it about the um, tragic hero? Well, the tragic hero remains in his isolation and he uh, chooses his uh, solitary end. Mm. What is important for that is that um, there is this built-in suggestion already that if we are to move beyond uh, this point of isolation, then some sort of connection will have to be formed that connects the different elements, including here uh, that of the tragic hero, with the other elements that are also in play. So once we come to that realization that developing these ideas in isolation is on the one hand necessary, we cannot begin with an all that thought addresses itself to. We cannot simply assume or assert that the, the object of thought, that the task of philosophy is to understand the one systematic whole of everything, but we have to take a step back. We have to take a step back and begin with three 
divergent elements that are enclosed in upon themselves and do not connect as such with the others. However, the next step will come in uh, Rosenzweig's argumentation when it becomes clear that um, none of these elements in and of them themselves can so you say, achieve what they, by their own lights, want or need. So, some sort of movement becomes necessary. And this is what takes place in the second of the three parts of the Star of Redemption, which is where things uh, become, perhaps, uh, for the non-Rosenzweig scholar, the most interesting. Because what happens is that where before we had the three elements of world, God, and man, now suddenly the suggestion is that there could be something as an opening of these elements to each other, not perhaps a hierarchization or a systematic way of integrating them, but nevertheless uh, a way of communicating and he will use the uh, he will use to indicate uh, these ways of communicating uh, terms that he now does not take from the philosophical tradition but from the theological one interestingly enough that is that precisely when he does so he is perhaps at his most skeptical of the traditions involved so the first part of the star has as dedication or superscription in philosophos with the Latin meaning in of against. Uh, this part is written against the philosophers. There can be no one all that we think of. The second part is written in same sense against the theologians, or at least that's what it says. But it does so precisely by, enjoy, by employing the... Uh, concepts of theology and bringing them into conversation with those of philosophy. Where philosophy had world, God, and man, now we get a connection between God and world. Namely, God creates the world. Creation. A, crea uh, a connection between God and man. God reveals himself to man in Revelation. And finally, third, man has to set out and redeem the world. So now we have next to each other, next to the concepts of God, man, and world, or rather world, God, and man, we now have creation, revelation, and um, redemption. It's important to remember, of course, that when Rosenzweig uses these concepts, he is not simply giving up on the philosophical enterprise and instead uh, letting good old theology ride to the rescue and uh, clean up the messes of the modern world. Um, he is using concepts that now are philosophical concepts within what is very much uh, a late idealist German philosophical system. Um, however, there's something peculiar about these concepts that uh, Rosenzweig thinks uh, the philosophical tradition has not been able to account for hitherto. And that is something along the lines of temporality. Creation, you see, has something to do with what's always already happened. Creation is about the past. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. At the same time, revelation, according to Rosenzweig at least, is not something that happened once upon a time when a, a man came down a mountain uh, with a certain message from God, but rather something that can and therefore should uh, happen again and again 
in human existence. And third, the idea of redemption, that the world might be brought to reach the perfection that uh, it always held within it as a promise, is something that is very much in the future. And in fact, as far as human existence is concerned, always remains in the future. Um, so if, and particularly this at the end is, is uh, important here, if Rosenzweig is a thinker of redemption, and the, the book is called The Star of Redemption after all, the idea is not if we just uh, pursue this program that we have in hand now, then uh, redemption will be reached. In fact, the way in which a thinker like Rosenzweig departs from the fundamental impetus of both Hegelianism and also Marxism is precisely to say the idea that in time, in our lives, uh, redemption could be achieved is itself the greatest threat of the possibility of redemption. Right? We remain open towards a future that is to come as we will you know later and en endlessly get uh, in in french thinkers as well uh, like derrida l'avenir uh, so too here in rosenzweig do we very much um, have this idea of past present and future in a philosophical sense that cannot be forced into uh a system that achieves completeness, but is always temporally spread out instead. Uh, when you were when you were speaking about that, just before you even brought up Derrida, I was thinking about the idea of the other um, mm -hmm. call to the other. Um, when you were speaking about Derrida along with the stars, so um, that's great <laughs> and. Fantastic. That, there you touch upon something very interesting, uh, but also something very tricky. It's tricky because much of the reception of Rosenzweig as a thinker in the 20th century has been influenced by the fact that um, a certain other thinker um, who happens to be Emmanuel Levinas, uh, says some very flattering things uh, at the beginning of his main work. So Levinas's Totalité et Infini uh, has the remark in its opening that the presence of Rosenzweig in this book is so great. He's so everywhere that I've you know not been able to even refer to him explicitly because I would have to keep doing it every sentence. Now, of course, uh, Levinas is the paradigmatic thinker of the encounter with the other. And so um, the question is, to what extent is this also the question with Rosenzweig? There, I am not sure that um, the system that Rosenzweig presents is as easily amenable to Levinas's desires as he himself seems to think. Um, for one, uh, Rosenzweig is very much a systematic thinker, even though he, the, he thinks that the system has to be spread out in time uh, and that traditional philosophy from Ionia to Jena has not been able to do that. He is nevertheless a thinker, and this brings us to the third part of the Star of Redemption, who believes that the goal of philosophy, the systematic goal of philosophy, is ultimately to contemplate the one and all. Now, this may not be in our reach, this may not be direct, but nevertheless, uh, there is a sense in which um, Rosenzweig is not a thinker who, who objects to the very idea of totality as such. Uh, whereas this is uh, Levinas's constant hobby horse. Right? This is uh, the main thrust of his, uh, his philosophy. And so it's, it's been suggested that one reason why Levinas is uh, keen to affiliate himself with Rosenzweig's project is because by the time he does this, it's become much more difficult for him 
to speak more openly about uh, a more problematic relationship to another thinker that he has, but who is nevertheless much closer to him in many ways, and that would be Heidegger. Right? Separated by the Gulf of the, the, the Second World War, um, it becomes very difficult for <clears throat> Levinas to <clears throat> have a non-antagonistic relationship to Heidegger. But nevertheless, um, I think it is uh, clear to anyone who's familiar with their work that uh, there is, on a concrete level, much more Heidegger in Levinas than there is Rosenzweig. Rosenzweig is not a phenomenologist. Um, is not a thinker who is against totality and is not, first and foremost, a thinker of the other, of the radical other. So what instead do we get in Rosenzweig in the third part of uh, the star is fascinating. Um, fascinating in its bizarreness, one might be tempted to say, because... Having set out the idea that creation, revelation, and redemption are the uh, fundamental thoughts that allow us to position ourselves um, in the world and connect, even if not systematize uh, rigorously, the world, God and man. Um, he then gives us two different ways in which we live this awareness of temporality, so to say. And uh, those two ways of living are the, the, the existential possibilities offered by, on the one hand, Christianity, and on the other hand, Judaism. Um That is to say, at this point, we leave, uh, one might say, the strictly philosophical, and we enter into a more sociological, religious uh, sphere where um, Rosenzweig wants to demonstrate how religious traditions are a way of living one's openness towards a future which is not there yet, and they do so in different ways. Two fundamentally different ways that clash and are irreconcilable. This is interesting because, of course, um, when you say that Rosenzweig is a thinker who has a systematic place, systematic need even, for both Judaism and Christianity, that sounds warm and ecumenical. But in a way, nothing could be further from the truth. According to Rosenzweig, they are mortal enemies and must remain such um, if they are each to do uh, what their job is. And what would that be? Well, the idea of Christianity, stripping it down to very, very basic uh, form here, would be that precisely the idea that the world requires being redeemed. We need to go out into the world and, as individuals, spread the flame of uh, an ethical form of life. Um, ethical is a dangerous word here, um, but let's let's go with that for now. Um, and so. Um, Christianity is an active force in the world and uh, seeking actively to bring about redemption. On the other hand, it is the task of Judaism precisely not to be caught up in that, precisely to be on the side of saying, whatever the Christians have come up with this time, we have not yet reached redemption. And the Jew can say this, according to Rosenzweig, because the Jew has already reached redemption. Now, that's a very odd thought, um, at least on the surface of things. But what he means by that specifically is the idea that Judaism, um, as a set 
of practices. He's not so much interested in religious ideas, um, but he is very interested in religious practices in the liturgical year, for example. Judaism, uh, on a formal level, in celebrating his feasts, is already at the point of redemption, where it is one with God. Now, the problem with that is it's only formal. And so it is not connected to any actual state in the world. But it's precisely that distance from the world, it's precisely the fact that Judaism has turned away from the world, turned away from history, that it can keep intervening. And every time that the Christian world believes it has now created an order, a political order, an order of salvation, an ethical order, that is complete, and that we should all submit to, that the Jew serves as reminder that this project is, in fact, incomplete. And so uh, it becomes Judaism's job to continuously burst the bubble of the non-Jewish world and to force history to keep moving, even though Judaism itself does not intervene in the moving of history. Um, so it's not it's so it's not like uh, two two separate realities that are functioning in order like two sides of a coin in a sense. So what is his? He's a traditionalist in a sense, right? He he sees the tradition of of maintaining, I guess you could say. Yom Kippur, um, uh, many of the Jewish holidays. Well, he, thinks that, he, he thinks that religion is something you do, right? And so in this sense, there is a great departure here from 19th century liberal Judaism in the same way that someone like Karl Barth represents a real departure from 19th century liberal Protestantism. Uh, the idea is not, it's ultimately about the ideas. The thing to contrast this with, for example, would be uh, the work of a thinker that Rosenzweig much admires and thinks that in a certain sense he is improving upon um, Hermann Cohen's religion of reason out of the sources of Judaism. Right Now, uh, Cohen himself is a religious Jew, uh, and so... It won't simply go to say that Cohen has no time for uh, Jewish tradition in its practical aspects, but nevertheless, the idea seems to be that what counts is the ethical ideas. And here it is for someone like uh, Cohen as well that, for example, Lutheranism and Judaism can be best friends because at the end of the day, they are thick descriptions, metaphorical forms for certain ethical ideals. Uh, ideals, thoughts. Um, and ultimately, that's where the importance uh, that's where the importance lies, our ethical action in the world. Whereas for Rosenzweig, the point of religion is not to give us ideas. The point of religion is to engage us in practices that allow us not just to think about certain things, but to live in a certain way to live in a certain way, specifically as regards time. With a year, um, ceremonies and feasts come back, right? Every week, every Shabbat. And it's precisely this sort of temporal nature and practical nature of uh, religion that Rosenzweig is interested in. This almost reminds me of what you were talking about with the tragic figure. You know, there's something that Nietzsche says that that with the dialectic and with Christianity, we lose the fest, the, the fest of dates, the festivals of of Dionysus and and Apollo, and and that these were things that were needed for the Greeks at the time. So it seems um, I don't want to throw <laughs> I don't want to throw an almost pagan idea onto Judaism, but it seems as though these kind of dates help with the individual struggle um, in the world. Well, I guess, with their own kind of constituents in the world, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not a merely individual struggle. 
uh, much the contrary, I think. Uh, religion for Rosenzweig is necessarily communal. And the level of my individual life and my individual responsibility is one that plays out on a different on a different level. Right. This openness towards the future is one that we primarily experience together in symbolic acts, right, in formal acts that in and of themselves don't change anything. They don't make anything better. Right. The world doesn't grow any more flowers if we sing in mass or, you know, <laughs> if we if we celebrate uh, uh, Yom Kippur. Um, so something else must be going on uh, is uh is the idea there but that is not an individual uh thing so much yeah uh at the same time rosenzweig has very specific ideas about what forms of religion are good and not and so he um it's very clear that christianity and judaism particularly because of the the way in which they integrate temporality within their cult are um the religions and he spends a good amount of time on uh, describing why uh, chinese and indian thought but also in particular uh, why islam are all sort of failed attempts at something like religion uh, well strictly speaking Chinese and uh, Indian thought uh, belong to the realm of philosophy. So, but there too, um, Rosenzweig will say, well, actually, you know, uh, Greek pagan thought was much better than what the others uh, came up with. And it's only if you pass through Greek pagan thought that you can then get to the monotheisms that he's interested in. Uh, these are, of course, um, reconstructions, systematizations of uh, religious faiths that someone else might not recognize themselves in. It's perfectly possible that one might say, uh, as a as a Muslim, that uh, what Rosenzweig has to say is uh, not quite the sort of experience uh, that one has. However, um, this is also what in part makes it interesting. The big problem uh, with Islam for Rosenzweig for example, is that it's essentially too much like German idealism. A curious thing to say. Um, so, yes, um, in the ongoing uh, anti-Islam uh, debate in the West, this is not an argument that has been made too often in these last uh, 20, 30 years, uh, I would say. The problem is that uh, uh, Islam is too much like, uh, like, like Hegel. But that is what Rosenzweig says boils down to. What does that mean here? Well, it doesn't have a proper relationship to time. Um, it would go too far here to dig into uh, more details of that. Um, but Rosenzweig then is not someone who is uh, interested in having some sort of a ecumenical uh, idea of uh, all the wonderful things that uh, different forms of religion uh, could bring. He's a situated thinker. You know, the history of our world is the history of our world. But, you know, as a German, this is the horizon uh, of my thoughts as well. And so it is uh, Christianity and, uh, and Judaism that he is ultimately interested in to the extent that he that other things come within the horizon of his thought they serve as foils they serve as sort of stepping stones for showing uh, how not to do things so you answered my question i was about to ask you what what rosenzweig's relationship to judaism was so i think you, you you've done that i think you've answered that well um now I guess. Well, of course. Uh, hang on, hang on. Hang okay. On. There, okay. There, sure. There are, there are different things at, at play here. There is, you know, the relationship of the star of redemption to Judaism, on the one hand, and then there is Rosenzweig, the man who has a relationship to Judaism, and so um, it is not necessarily. Uh, those are not necessarily the same thing. Well, the, the one might not exhaust the other. Um, in fact, this might be a good point to uh, acknowledge that once he has finished the Star of Redemption and decided he does not wish to pursue an academic career, 
Rosenzweig decides instead to found uh, an institute for uh, adult Jewish learning, so-called free, uh, uh, the free Jewish um, Lehrhaus uh, in Frankfurt. And uh, it becomes uh, the, the goal of his activity to um, educate uh, assimilated German Jews back into the Judaism from which they have become estranged in many ways through uh, engaging with uh, different ideas and, and different authors on a linguistic level, uh, but looking at every stage to find something like what Jewish life could look like. Um, and this also means that uh, after the finishing of the Star of Redemption, he uh, devotes his time to several uh, projects uh, in writing to further that, one of which is the translation of the poems of a famous medieval uh, Jewish religious poet, Yehuda Halevi. Um, and also with his friend Martin Buber, um, the uh, audacious uh, attempt at retranslating the whole Bible from scratch. Uh, that is to say, uh, the Hebrew Bible, of course, because the New Testament is uh, <laughs> not what's interesting uh, for him in this particular perspective. Why do you think he couldn't, why do you think he did not finish the star? What What do you think it was? Um... Oh, no, no, hang on, hang on. If I, if you thought I, impl if, if I seem to have implied that, then let me correct that immediately. The star was finished. Okay. But it's a project. The star is a perfectly finished systematic work and actually went to the press a little bit late because it was hard to find paper in post First World War uh, Germany to print it on and to you know find the money to get it all organized. But uh, no, it's a, it's a complete work, not a torso. And subsequently, he let it fend for itself and said about it, it is merely a system of philosophy, no? for better or worse. And so uh, in the essay that I mentioned earlier, the New Thinking essay from 1925, he somewhat ironically comments on the fact that, you know, whoever got it uh, as a present and expected to find uh, a, a real Jewish book was bound to be very disappointed in uh, a rather abstruse and uh, <laughs> metaphysical uh, pile of homework rather than something that would in and of itself uh, allow one to feel warm, pious uh, thoughts connected to Judaism. That was not the uh, point that that book wished to drive home. So I'm just going to press you on one more question about the relationship between Christianity and Judaism. Um, it seems like the for Rosenzweig, um, I'm not really, I'm not really sure about their relationship with with one another or what he was fully expecting with the, um, with just Judaism and Christianity. Right. So what we need, what um, human existence is aiming for, as such, for Rosenzweig has to be something like redemption. And redemption concretely means um, something like the achievement of justice in the world. We've already seen that this is not something he thinks that can be achieved in the temporal realm, in actual history, and that the attempt to bring uh, it actually about in that way is itself a tyrannical impulse that is connected to our striving for justice in ways that we cannot simply get rid of. So we need redemption, we strive for it, and yet our very striving is often what, is, what prevents us from reaching it. And this is sort of inherent and most clear in Christianity, which of course is still uh, 
which on the one hand believes that Christ has already come. We already have the truth. We just have to go out in the world and implement it. Right? That's one thing. On the other, uh, salvation is not complete yet. Right? We have not reached the end of times. Okay. So, in order to keep that gap open between uh, our need for salvation and the idea that we might even that we might ever complete it, Judaism is necessary as the reminder that what Judaism already has in its formal aspect, the perfection of its own liturgical life, is not something that has already been achieved actually in history, and in fact not something that could be fully achieved in history. The problem, of course, with this from anyone who wants to live these concepts is that it uh, creates two uh, modes of religious existence that are uh, that are uh, incompatible but nevertheless need each other um, but in which also um, one plays a rather you know, uh, un ungrateful role of having to be the naysayer. And so uh, there, is a, there is a sense in which uh, Rosenzweig has to be willing, and indeed is, to take a systematic uh, dislike, at least to say it mildly, of the Jews as a systematic condition for our ethical and religious lives. Because only by upsetting the Christian order, by overturning it, by puncturing its pretentious, can Judaism fulfill its role. And uh, that is perhaps not a role that everyone may feel happy to have to play. It seems less than comfortable at certain moments. And uh, one can't help but wonder whether if Rosenzweig had lived beyond 1929, um, and seeing what would come in the uh, decade uh, or two next, um, he would have uh, still described things in this particularly stark, uh, harsh light. Well, I, I think um, that's a perfect place to, to end our discussion on Rosenzweig. Martin, I wanna thank you so much for navigating us through both his life um, and his philosophy, and also teasing out these these hard concepts and difficult questions. So thank you so much for for doing this and and bringing to life to this this very um, dynamic thinker. Thank you. Oh, I'm muted. Sorry. Um, thank you so much for being here and. Um, uh, take care.